discussing and talking about is how to manage capital projects. And it's something that I've been involved with uh, almost throughout my career. I started a Cummins engine company in 1994 as a manufacturing engineer. And two weeks in, I got my first project and I was supposed to purchase a wash system. And so uh, I made every mistake that I talk about in these sessions. Uh, through that time, obviously I've, I've continued to work in the capital equipment industry and uh, been involved in over 500 projects. So put this together essentially to help people improve the decision-making, improve um, their overall performance uh, as it relates to uh, integrating capital projects into their facility. So that's why I created this because there's really no course that I took in school, uh, at least not at Purdue University, that uh, taught me how to manage capital projects. So uh, that's what this is all about. So today we're going to talk about supplier selection. And uh, so it is, this is the, this is the um, most important aspect of capital projects is choosing the correct supplier. Obviously, I've been involved with this for many, many years and uh, throughout the years have seen companies make poor decisions, um, decisions based on uh, cost mainly. That's the most common issue. You know, if, if we quote $2 million and, and somebody else quotes a million dollars, well, there are a million reasons why you really need to look into the difference between the quote. But oftentimes, especially when purchasing gets involved, uh, that, that, that tractor beam pull towards saving a million dollars uh, will justify a lot of decisions. And I tell a story in a, in a little book that I wrote uh, about a customer of ours that's down in Mexico. And they had two lines that they needed to build. And we had built uh, every line for this facility uh, that they had uh, in their Mexico facility. I think they had four lines at the time. And so uh, we quoted them this equipment and they were like, oh, you know, that's, let's uh, quote some local suppliers. The local supplier, I think we were at maybe two and a half million. The local supplier was at a million. Literally, they were at a million for both lines. And um, they were intrigued and they justified the purchase of that equipment based on the fact that that supplier was just down the road from them. So literally 15 minutes away, they could drive there, they could manage it, they could help out however they needed to and essentially have oversight that justified the million and a half dollars worth of savings. Um, well, they didn't succeed in that process. The line was incredibly late. Um, and, and it didn't work. They actually called us to come in and help them to get the line functioning and to build the second line. They lost their Q1 uh, flag from Ford as a result of the equipment uh, not performing correctly. They had any number of challenges that went along with that. So um, that's not to poke anybody in the eye, but the point is that when you make decisions uh, strictly based on the financial aspects, then it's highly likely that you're going to make a bad decision. So decisions should be made first on the technical acumen and the ability of the company. So anyway, we're going to talk about that. That's, uh, that's what today's topic is about. As you can tell, I'm a little passionate about uh, supplier selection and making sure that companies do this, pro do this right. Let me tell you about CapEx. Uh, we are a, a sales agency located in North Carolina, South Carolina, in Virginia, we represent uh, amazing companies like ATC Automation out of Cookville, Tennessee. I always say 85% of their business is repeat business year over year. So that means that uh, companies come back time and time again. So we've got 15% you know, new customers, but the majority of the work that we're doing is with repeat customers. And in this industry, that says more than industry, more than anything, because there are a lot of dead bodies out there. Uh, as far as poor projects and you know not that every project that we've ever done has been amazing but uh, we follow through and we support it and we continue to provide um, for the customer's needs uh, uh, after each project so cincinnati test systems the largest leak test company in the world it's crazy when i started working with them back in the back in the mid 90s um, not to 
not near what they are today, but they have uh, just continued to grow and, and so proud of their, their progress. Uh, but they are uh, technology leaders in the leak test industry as well. Duquesne, uh, plastic joining, every type of plastic joining that you can imagine, uh, vibration welding, hot plate welding, ultrasonic welding, laser welding, infrared welding, 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 you put plastic together, uh, you think about a way and they do it. I think maybe even with Bic lighters, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, they'll, they do plastic joining. Symmetric is a, uh, a high speed in process test and data company that is a part of Cincinnati Test Systems, but uh, they have a, a special uh, responsibility outside of just tests. So they are essentially data solutions, industry 4.0 uh, strategy. Keller Technologies here in Fort Mill, South Carolina, they do um, industrial filtration. They have a comprehensive line of air filtration, wet and dry solutions. All right, so that's the commercial aspect of this entire conversation that we're having today. Uh, so I wanna talk about, again, the number one mistake uh, of capital project managers is choosing the wrong supplier. I've seen it uh, hundreds of times in my career. So here's some ways and strategies for avoiding uh, this uh, issue. So do the homework and define the ideal who. So who is the ideal company that is going to integrate the project that you are looking to um, to install. So who would be the right person to make this happen? So the, the who is the most important aspect of a capital project because the who is the person that's actually gonna, or the company that's gonna, that is gonna actually build the equipment. Uh, so we wanna make a list of the ideal qualities of the supplier that we want. So what are the ideal qualities? We're gonna talk through this uh, as we move through. We wanna use that list to create the ideal who avatar, right? So we wanna uh, you know, essentially build the ideal supplier for our application. And then we want to create a selection matrix that aligns with our ideal avatar. We want to monitor and then score the supplier on responsiveness, creativity, flexibility, attention to detail. And then we're gonna ask for, and we're gonna check references. So important if you've never used this company before that you do your homework, do your due diligence in making certain that this company has been successful, uh, ideally in similar type of applications that you are looking to utilize them for. So those are the fundamentals to help you avoid making the mistakes. So we're going to talk about this and get very clear. You know, what I've talked about it throughout this process of capital project mastery is learning to create a vision, create a vision for the project uh, overall, create a vision for the team members that you're gonna have uh, helping you with the project, create a vision for your supplier. You know, what, are, what is the ideal supplier? So putting all of this together uh, is extremely important. So what to look for in a supplier? So number one, general industry experience. So if you are in the medical industry, you ideally would want to partner with a supplier that has done medical industry work or is very familiar with the medical industry. That's important because there's a lot of nuances, a lot of unique uh, requirements for medical, uh, the medical industry just specifically as far as uh, what is required. So you want to make certain that the supplier that you're considering is a company that has experience in your industry. Uh, you wanna make sure that their location is something that is gonna be, if you wanna drive, then you, you obviously it's gotta be within a reasonable driving distance. Um, does it have to be stateside? Can it be in Europe? Can it be in Asia? You know, so you've gotta define what location is gonna be acceptable for the supplier, uh, especially based on the technology, right? So if you have, if you have been uh, purchasing technology um, that is uh, something that you've done over and over again, then you're going to have a comfort level uh, for going outside of your normal demographics or normal uh, area because you are so familiar with the technology. If it's a new technology, then you probably want to uh, really be thinking about that supplier location more so than again if you're not familiar with the technology because that 
if you have to be there a lot, if you have to uh, have a lot of training, a lot of learning, then the location will be uh, very important in that supplier selection. Process or technology experience. So very important that if you have a new process that you've never done, uh, you do not want to select a supplier that it's going to be a new process for them that they've never done, right? So that's those are two uh, people that don't know much getting together to do something that they've never done before. And that is just a recipe for uh, a not good outcome. So it's important that we're realistic. And one of the things that we do often is we will convince ourselves that we can make this work because both parties want to make it work. So we uh, go along uh, with our head in the sand at some level, uh, accepting that, you know, even though none of us have experience, but we're both competent, um, knowledgeable, we can make this happen. But the reality is that it doesn't make much sense to go with someone that's not done something before, uh, especially if you don't have that knowledge. So uh, nimble and responsive. This is very, very important. You want to work with companies that respond to your needs and they make adjustments. Um, oftentimes, I call it self-righteousness. These, these companies can develop a level of self-righteousness, meaning that, um, hey, you're lucky to work with me. And so if you want to work with me, this is, these are the criteria that you have to meet in order for me to be your supplier. And you don't want to work with those companies. Those companies, uh, as a general rule, are not in it for you. They're in it for themselves. So you want to steer clear of companies that are not uh, responsive to your needs. And you want, to, you want to measure that response as well. So we're going to talk about that as we, as we move forward in this conversation. Do they have local service? Is local service important to you? Do you have an internal maintenance team that's going to support the equipment? Or are you going to need that local support service and support to keep things going? So keep that top of mind um, and be prepared uh, to engage there. So past experience, very important as well. We've you know, talked about that. Have you had this? So this means have you, has your company had past experience with this supplier and what was that experience like? Was it a success? Um, did it work well? Uh, did it suck? You know, what, what was that experience like? Uh, do this, does this company have a global presence and is a global presence necessary for this application or for this particular project that you're working on? And do you need an engineering driven company? So is it an engineering driven decision that you're going to make? Do you need a company that is engineering driven and focused? Or if, you know, if that company is not, do you want more of a standard process type of company as opposed to an engineering driven solution? So these are some things to think about. Again, just kind of giving you food for thought uh, in your supplier uh, defining process. All right. So uh, when we talk about creating that avatar, so uh, again, big on vision, we, we want to create a vision for uh, the project overall, we want to create a vision for the team that we're going to select and, and implement and, and the vision for each of those individual roles. We want to create a vision for the suppliers. And quite frankly, we want to create a vision for our lives. That is, uh, that's how important vision is. Um, it's biblical, uh, as a matter of fact. So, uh, so here's an example of this. So the ideal supplier is located within driving distance to our facilities. And... Let's see, I'm gonna get to minimize this thing here because I can't see, okay. Uh, they utilize a team-based approach to project management and have been in business for over 10 years. They have direct experience with our product. The project requires induction heating and the supplier has induction heating experience. Now, I realize induction heating is not rocket science and has been done for years and years and years, but I was just using this as an example, okay? And uh, that was the first thing that popped in mind as I was going through this. They have a global presence, which could be important for duplicating equipment in China. They have proven to be easy to work with and are customer oriented. They have fairly local support and a 24 hour support hotline. This supplier is innovative and works with their suppliers to stay apprised of new technology. They rarely outsource aspects of the equipment. So, uh, meaning that, you know, obviously they keep all of the processes in house. So those are important things to consider. So that's just an idea, an example 
of this supplier avatar that you would create. So it's not rocket science. It's just a few sentences that we are writing that would, um, that would create this vision uh, for our project. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, next. Why is it not going to the next? Oh, there we go. All right, cool. So the supplier selection matrix, very important if you have multiple companies that you are looking to choose. It's very important that you have some type of matrix to compare these companies to each other to help ensure that you're using more of a fact-based methodology as opposed to an emotion-based uh, selection strategy. So emotions are important. We all purchase based on our emotions. We, we feel good. We feel uh, strongly that we should do something. We should purchase something. Uh, but the reality is, uh, from an engineering perspective, you know, from a logic perspective, we want to really consider uh, some of the more standard aspects so that we can do a comparison to make sure that we aren't uh, apples and oranges uh, with regards to the supplier options that we've got in front of us. So general concept, general concept is to create a spreadsheet with weighted formulas. And so here are some of the components that you might add to that spreadsheet and use as uh, some of the selection criteria. Uh, concept, operator safety, and ergonomics. So what are actually, I think this should be, oh, back on it. This should be concept, number one. And then, uh, and then next is operator safety and ergonomics. So concept is going to be the first uh, matrix uh, that's your first component of the matrix. Then the next one would be operator safety and, uh, and ergonomics. Then, uh, so this is going to drive me crazy here. All right, there we go. All right, get back to that. So operator safety and cycle time is, you know, is this, is the cycle time important? And I'm sure it is, right? Because you're going to base your return on capital. So your financial investments are going to be based on the cycle time. Um, because the faster you put it through, the less labor that you have, the more efficient you're going to be, and the more profitable that you could be uh, as it relates to this particular product. So the price, you know, what is the price? How important is the price in your selection matrix? You're, you can only weigh that internally and define it internally. Uh, what are the terms? Are the terms very important for you? What are the service capabilities of the company that you're, that you're going to choose from? How important is that to you? Uh, concept simplicity, you know, how simple is it? Is this an overly complex design that your supplier has quoted? And one company has a very simple design that's gonna have the same results? Uh, if so, obviously, uh, simplicity is very good for the long-term success of the project because complexity means that you're gonna have to have some people that know what's going on at all times to fix the equipment. You know, it's one of those stand on one leg and, and hold your mouth right in order for the equipment to work. And we never want to do that. We don't want it to be like fishing. Uh, so the common process for maintenance, uh, you know, so was it going to be, you know, something that you're doing in house that is from a maintenance perspective, going to be something that's easy for your maintenance team to do because they're already doing it. And then, uh, did they comply with the specification? So we talked about creating that specification. Did the supplier follow the guidelines that you provided for them? Too often, uh, they do not. I mean, we, oftentimes in talking with customers, we'll provide a 25 page quote and someone else will provide a seven page quote. And, and the customer's like, you know, clearly, um, they didn't comply with the specification. I'm just basing that on feedback that, I, that I've gotten from them. So obviously more words doesn't necessarily make it better, but if there are clarity in the writing of those words, then, then that, would be, that would be good. So as we continue on with, with ideas to consider for your spreadsheet and selection criteria, do they have similar equipment experience? What is their delivery? Are they 30 weeks and you need it in 24 or, or are they 30 weeks and you need it in 32 and everyone else is 34? You know, what, you know, how are you going to weigh that delivery aspect? Um, what the, how important is the warranty? Uh, 12 month, two year, 36 month, 
uh, common process for operation. So have you done these processes before? Are they going to utilize similar technology for these operations that you've used in the past? Are they, you know, again, complying with the specification using components that you have used in your facility so you're not reinventing the wheel? Uh, does the footprint comply with the available space that you have available to place this piece of equipment? Uh, is the overall, you know, how is the overall concept? Uh, what is that like? Um, technology experience. So does this company have experience with the technology that you are requiring for this particular uh, application? And then what is their promptness? <coughs> Excuse me. From a promptness perspective, and what most people miss, when you supply an RFQ, how quickly does that company reply back to you? I want you to, I want you to measure the company's interest in your project based on the feedback that you get from the beginning. If you say, if you raise your hand and say, we've got an application, how quickly is the supplier or potential supplier responding to you raising your hand? Uh, from my perspective, I want people to respond quickly because that is going to demonstrate their interest in my project. If they respond based on their own terms or whenever that's a good fit for them, then I say, wow, you know, my project isn't very important to them. Uh, and so I'm just going to take that into consideration. I'm not going to, I'm not going to eliminate, eliminate that company, but I'm definitely going to hold that in the back of my mind to be thinking, okay, uh, they didn't respond until, a week after I supplied the specifications. So that, uh, that to me is an indicator of, or an indication of their level of interest. Now, that is not always the case. I know companies are busy, people are on vacation, things happen, uh, but as a general rule, you wanna understand what was the cause for the delay. Was it just a lack of interest? Was it too busy? So what is that cause? Okay, so the supplier, selection process. So you're going to create a project spec. So we've already talked extensively about how to do that. Uh, you're going to use the avatar to determine the supplier, the suppliers that you want to quote the project. Uh, that, you know, that avatar process, what's good about that is it also eliminates companies, right? So companies can self-select based on not fitting that avatar uh, guide that you have created. You want to secure an NDA prior to submitting your company's technical information. Uh, and you want to make sure that you communicate the expectations to your supplier as well when you are submitting that NDA. Say, so, hey, here's how the process is going to work. Clearly lay it out. Again, create that vision for the supplier. Here's how we're going to do this. Um, and make sure that they understand that and, and are clear with your expectations. Then you're going to create a file transfer portal and upload that content after the NDA is uh, all done. You're gonna have the vision for the completed project. You're gonna have the project specifications. You're gonna have the part drawings and any functional specifications that go along with them. And you're also going to have any supplemental specifications for pressing as an example, or specific guidelines for induction heating or uh, any functional test specifications on how the temperature of the of the hydraulic fluid needs to be the viscosity of the hydraulic fluid and and everything that uh, that goes along with that uh, supplier request process so you want to set supplier meetings one week after the rfq is released right so you want to get them in and uh and go through you know answer their questions again when you're in this meeting uh, you want to monitor the supplier engagement and the quality of questions because if they come to this meeting completely unprepared and is waiting for you to download information to them, then that's a lazy supplier. And that is at some level indicative of probably what they're gonna be like when you have to actually work with them if you choose them as a supplier. So again, uh, people don't just shape up whenever you give them money. People are always representative of how they are gonna be so what you have to do is from the beginning, as a potential buyer, I want you to be vigilant in monitoring the level of interest that these companies have. And if they are not uh, fully engaging, if they're not asking smart questions, if they're not providing creative solutions and, and engaging you and challenging you on the application, then 
I encourage you to reconsider that supplier or at least keep that in your mind as uh, a concern for this company long term. Uh, internal review meeting for the matrix uh, review and selection. So that's going to be getting your selection team together to go over the matrix that you've created. And I've shown as an example, uh, some of the components that you might ask. And then the uh, visit, you want to visit the selected vendor prior to PO release. I encourage it, do not issue purchase orders without actually confirming that the company um, can can do or has the facility and the means to execute your project. Uh, that, that company down there in Mexico, uh, we drove by it and it had dirt floors. So the building that they were gonna be building the equipment in, it literally had dirt floors. So uh, we realized early on that we were gonna struggle to beat this company in, in, in from a price perspective, but we knew that we would have them from a, uh, an understanding of the overall process and technology perspective. So. And that, uh, you know, of course, eventually came full circle. Again, not to, that isn't a, a point to brag on, but it's just when you, sometimes these things are obvious uh, and bad decisions can be obvious when you're, when you're selecting, you know, getting the wrong supplier. Here are the common mistakes that I've seen throughout my 20 plus years uh, in engineering and in capital equipment is not clearly defining the ideal supplier partner. Okay, so not clearly defining the ideal supplier partner is a common mistake accepting suppliers claims at face value you know this is due diligence this is smart buying uh, someone tells you they've done something follow up make sure that they've actually done it get the voice of their customer to confirm that they executed they executed a high level they did what they promised and what they said they were going to do um, compromising on required criteria so you have this, this list of criteria that you don't want to compromise, and, uh, but, the, but the price is so, so enticing. Uh, so just, it's like, a, it's like a gravitational pull. You just want to select them because you're gonna save 500 grand. Well, in doing so, you would be compromising the criteria that you've set forth. So it's important that you don't compromise. If you said this is important to you, don't compromise on it uh, because it's going to cost you long term. It always does. It always comes back to haunt you long term. I've seen it time and time again. Uh, so talking yourself into a good price. Again, this you know a lot of this conversation goes around pricing uh, because I've seen so many mistakes based on pricing. But uh, you talk yourself into a good price, uh, not explaining the selection process. So just willy nilly going about it, not having an intentional strategy for selecting the right supplier again, is a recipe for disaster. So make it very clear. So decide in the beginning and then uh, deliver based on that expectation um, that you've set forth. Uh, not visiting supplier prior to PO, that's a, that's a problem. Again, that dirt floor company, like I mentioned, that is an issue. And then uh, you know, not checking references. So you wanna make sure, again, that you're getting the voice of their customer in confirmation and confirmation and knowing that the references that they give you are gonna naturally be biased because Clearly, they've had a success at that company. If you can find a supplier or a customer of theirs that they didn't have as a reference and engage them, um, I highly encourage you to do that because that's going to give you some insight as well. And then, uh, you know, convincing yourself that the proximity allows influence. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, there's a company down in Columbia, South Carolina, that uh, they selected a, a company that was right in their town that they could go visit and, and felt like they could have oversight. But the reality is they don't own the company. So they are not able to direct the resources at that company. They are the customer, they can show up, but they're not going to determine what people are working on their project. So they naively thought that, yeah, so there's a cost savings, but if things go wrong, I can be there. Uh, I can be there to manage things. I can be there to influence things, but that's really in that situation was not the case. So they ended up, you know, six months late because they really had no control over the project. But in the beginning, they convinced themselves uh, that they did. So and just some things to keep in mind, common mistakes. I've seen them time and time again, and I don't want you to make them. I want you to follow 
these guidelines and processes that I have mentioned here in selecting the right supplier. Next, we've got uh, Capital Project 101, essentially, so the blocking and tackling. So we have, we have uh, gotten clear in defining the project. We have uh, selected the team. We have created the RFQ. We have selected the supplier. Now it's time to execute the project. So I call this the blocking and tackling. This is the boring aspect of a capital project, but absolutely the most important aspect of managing capital project. Because if you don't do the blocking and tackling, you're going to, which, which largely involves communication, uh, you're gonna end up struggling in the end. So excited to have that conversation with you all next week. If you need any help at all, we've got an amazing team. Uh, we don't thank you enough as a customer. We are grateful for the opportunity to serve you. We are here to serve you, our mission is to always be adding value. That's why we're having these webinars, these conversations, is we wanna help you be better at your craft. We wanna help you grow in your career and we wanna help you if you need capital equipment as well. So contact Mike Dorsey if you are in the Carolinas and you need automation, leak testing, ultrasonic welding, um, please uh, reach out. Chris Mullins is uh, Eastern North Carolina and Eastern Virginia. And then we've got uh, Adam Hooper, Western North Carolina and then select uh, upstate South Carolina accounts. So. Um, did I miss anything? Any, any questions? Anything that, uh, that anybody has uh, on our side, Chris or Vicki? Not from my side, Russ. I think you uh, covered it very well. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you for that feedback, Mr. Mullins. Be safe. Sounds like you're on the road. Um, again, we appreciate each and every one of you and are grateful for the opportunity to serve you. If you ever have any questions, just let us know. Uh, my email address is russ at capexsales.com as well. So uh, we welcome any questions, anything that we can do to better serve you. Uh, we, that's what we're here for. We're we are here to serve you. And if we're not serving you, then um, we're not doing our job. Have an amazing day. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.